What an awesome, and I guess at the end of the day, sort of emotionally staggering film. Uh, I think the, the, uh, I was really <laughs> moved in many ways by the faces of the scientists at one point at that conference, but also by the ending as well when they went for the dive in the still intact part of the Great Barrier Reef. And I think the um, film itself raises a question that I think we really want to deal with here as part of what we're going to talk about um, is, you know, how do we communicate this to the public? And I'd say also, how do we communicate this to the body politic and the politicians as well, and policy makers? Um, and what can be done about uh, some of these issues and things? So uh, we're really honored to have a great panel. Uh, I want to thank them for coming out here today. Uh, to talk a little bit and more particularly about Hawaii as well as the broader issues around coral reefs. So um, let me introduce everyone on this uh, distinguished panel, sort of from left to right. Uh, to my left is Dr. Cynthia Hunter, who spent the last 40 years or so exploring the reefs in Hawaii, Micronesia, Polynesia, Florida, and the Caribbean. Um, she has degrees in zoology from Cal State Long Beach, University of South Florida, and the University of Hawaii. And she oversee, saw the really remarkable collections at the uh, Waikiki Aquarium, where she learned more than a few things about fish and other animals with backbones. But uh, as she said, she prefers to st study organisms of the squishier sort. So she's now an associate professor of biology at UH Manoa, and uh, where her current uh, research focuses on coral reef ecosystems function and uh, how they sustain themselves. To her left is Dr. Bob Richman, who's a research professor and director of the University of Hawaii's Kualo uh, Marine Laboratory. And he's been studying coral reef ecosystems for about the same time, 43 years. <laughs> Um, he's the past president of the International Society for Reef Studies, was the convener for the 13th International Coral Reef Symposium, which I was at what was uh, pictured in the movie, in the film, and he serves as science advisor to the All Islands Committee of the U.S. Coral Reef Task Force and a science advisor for the Joint Ocean Commission Initiative. Um, his childhood fascination with Dr. Doolittle helped his, uh, inspire his approach to studying coral reefs, which I think he'll probably share with you a little bit. Um, and then uh, to his left is Josh Stanbro, who was raised in Northern California on an apple farm. Um, following, co co uh, following college, he traveled in the Asia Pacific region, sailing across the Pacific on an escort boat with a traditional Polynesian voyaging canoe. Josh has a law degree from UC Berkeley, and he's the former head of the Trust for Public Lands Hawaii office, and then was director of the Environment and Sustainability Program at the Hawaii Community Foundation. He's now Chief Resilience Officer for the City and County in Honolulu, as well as the Executive Director for the Office of Climate Change, Sustainability, and Resiliency. So, it's a long title, but an important one. So, uh, and to his left, finally, is Shale Matsuda. Shale is a PhD student at the UH, at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology and the University of Hawaii Manoa, and he's part of the laboratory of Dr. Ruth Gates, who was in the film as well. And he uses DNA sequencing and 3D imaging to research the dynamic symbiosis between coral and microbial partners. Um, and I'd also say one of the things he noted in here I think is as vital as anything these days, he's also an active science communicator and a storyteller, which probably is needed more than ever. So without further ado, I'll ask, uh, sort of kick it off with some basic questions for folks. And we'll try and keep this part to about a half an hour, and then we'd like to open it up to questions, because I know you all have a lot of them. So let me just start with Bob. Um, what really is the state of coral reefs in Hawaii and elsewhere, as well as talk a little bit about the current research in the field and what's going on? Sure. Thanks very much, and 
first and foremost, thanks to Civil Beat um, for putting this on and also for Nathan and your other reporters that have done a great job in trying to raise community awareness and giving uh, those of us who study coral reefs uh, outlet um, so that people can know what's going on. Um, regarding the state of reefs in Hawaii, there's a full range, and uh, I should acknowledge uh, Dr. Jim Maragos, who's kind of the godfather of coral reef studies here in Hawaii, um, is in the audience today, so you can keep us honest. Um, we see everything from reefs that are in pretty good shape to those that have been truly devastated. And what we see in Hawaii is a combination of the local stressors. Um, all one has to do is look at uh, the brown water events we get every time it rains. Um, of all the places I've studied in the world, Hawaii's got one of the most efficient systems for killing coastal reefs I've seen anywhere in the world with these concrete runways that go right from the mountains to the sea. Um, anything that happens on land today is gonna be in the ocean tomorrow. And we have areas that we've been studying in Maui and uh, Mauna Loa Bay, um, just over in Hawaii Kai. After one big rainstorm in 2008, uh, we had 20 tons of sediment deposited at the second marker buoy um, in the channel out of the marina. And that gives you an idea of what's going on at the local level. Uh, you add that to overfishing, which takes away the lawnmowers. Anybody who lives, especially on the windward side, where I'm from, um, if it rains anywhere on island, it's right behind our house. And you can hear the grass growing at night. So you know what happens when you take away the lawnmowers. And that's the other problem we have in Hawaii with the overfishing, particularly of the reef lawn mowers, the herbivores, and the addition of nutrients coming in. Uh, we do have some very serious local problems, but nothing escaped the bleaching events we had in 2014 and 2015, um, including areas in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. So uh, when you look at the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, Papanamokuakea, um, those reefs should be some of the best in the world, and they are. Um, there's some spectacular reefs up there, but starting in 2002, again 2004, again 2010, uh, the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands did get hit by bleaching events. And I think that's the main point, is no matter what you do locally, no one can escape the impacts of climate change and the bleaching events that have occurred. Um, I was involved in the studies of the first major bleaching event in 1982 in Panama. I went down to work with Dr. Peter Glenn after just finishing my PhD and saw extensive reef death there. And uh, Hawaii's got a very interesting history, too, of being able to reverse, and I think that's an important thing to point out, is even though the reefs of the world, and uh, they did get it at the end, I wish they would have started a little bit earlier, um, the conclusion from the Coral Reef Symposium we had here last year, uh, we had over 2,500 scientists, practitioners, stakeholders from 97 nations here, and the outcome and the punchline basically was coral reefs are threatened but not doomed. And we've seen very good examples of that here in Hawaii. Kaneohe Bay in particular was the site of a major sewer outfall into the bay. And when that was diverted to the outside, corals did come back. Uh, we've seen areas that have been really hit hard by the bleaching. And we do see areas that are beginning to recover again. So I think the most important message that I have and the one that they spoke at the end is I am a reef optimist. Otherwise, I can't get out of bed in the morning. Um, but the reefs of Hawaii have shown resilience. Um, they can continue to do so, but that will require for us to control local stressors today and actively uh, address the issue of climate change so that there's hope for the future. Thanks. Um, Dr. I wanted to kind of pick up on some of that. Um, and really, when you watch a movie like this, despite the cheery ending, it's easy to come away sort of depressed and feeling that doom and gloom, but are there reasons to be optimistic and what's the kind of research, what's going on out there that might make us feel some optimism? There are many reasons to stay optimistic and uh, one of them is events like this. Thank you um, and Civil Beat and Mariko for organizing this today and all of you for being here and, and hearing this story. Um, I, wasn't it funny when he said, you can you know, explain this and show your emotion, but don't cry. <laughs> I cried the first time I saw it. I cried this afternoon. You can't help it. And, and the most moving moment is watching that group um, at the um, event that Bob um, put together for all of us, um, led us all through. Um, and there is optimism in that group because that's what keeps us um, going. And we also have young people like Shale and, and, and many others. Even though the, the Catlin um, videos failed, um, 
during that bleaching event, we had many other researchers and students in the field during that time from the Gates Lab, from the Richmond Lab, from the Joe Keel Lab, uh, from the Hunter Lab, as well as the state. The agencies were out there, maybe not every moment of every day, but at least weekly, watching the bleaching occur. We had up to 80% bleaching on the Big Island, up to 50% mortality. Um, and these were back-to-back -back bleaching events in 2014 and 2015. Uh, one of the students in my lab, Taylor Massey, though has found that corals didn't get hit as hard in 2015. So there's some resiliency that we can already start to see. Um, you'll hear more from Shale in a minute about where the Gates Lab is taking that, but we're seeing in the field uh, reasons for hope. Um, I also want to honor the presence of Dr. Jim Maragos here today, who literally wrote the book, the first book on reef corals in Hawaii. Um, we all depended on him for how, what the, the names of the species are here. Another person... <laughs> Thank you, Jim, for so many of the things that you've done. He's not just named them, but he's studied coral reefs around the world. Another person whose work I'd like to recognize is Dr. Alan Friedlander, right in front of Dr. Maragos, who is a fish guy, but he is working with a team from National Geographic, uh, the Pristine Seas Program, and they identify sites like those uh, mentioned at the end of this film to go to, to work to protect the, the, the great places. Um, but it's not just these last great places globally. Kaneohe Bay looks better than when I first saw it in 1983. Hanama Bay still looks great if you go outside where all of the tourists are still trampling the reefs. Um, Waikiki is a mess for, for many, many reasons. Um, some that Bob just mentioned, Monolua Bay is a mess. Um, but Lanikai still has some great corals. North Shore still has some great coral reefs. We have to focus on the species and the individuals that are that do remain and the reasons why and take this new understanding into the future so shale i wanted to ask you about the sort of innovative research that's happening out at the gates lab with assisted evolution and a little bit about uh, that whole concept i know there's some controversy or some cautions around that but i'd love to um hear you talk uh, a little bit about the work out there and, and your work Absolutely. Um, so uh, I'm going to stand up. Uh, <laughs> sitting down thing. So I'm here um, on behalf of Ruth Gates. Uh, the lab is doing a lot of really exciting uh, projects right now. And as you kind of saw with a lot of what's going on in, in the film, there's, we're trying to figure out what's going to happen to the corals out there as the sea uh, temperatures continue to rise. But we're also really interested in what can we do pro proactively to help these corals uh, be ready to to live through these conditions. And so, as you mentioned, this whole idea of assisted evolution, human-assisted evolution, and what that sort of is, is how can we, using the natural flexibility of these animals, kind of help them become more able to survive the stress? So, as you mentioned, there's a little bit of you know, controversy around that idea, but we're, we're, not, we're not going in there and gene editing, anything like that. We're basically looking at, really, what, are these, what can these animals do? Like, what can they withstand, and how can we help them do that better. So for example, some of the projects that are going on in Ruth's lab are looking at kind of like running these corals through like a treadmill experiment, like how, how if you would do if you were an athlete training for a race, if you know, you push yourself harder and harder, but slowly and under the right circumstances, can we help build their tolerance? So when it gets warmer, when you do see those events where they're being exposed to these temperatures again and again, year after year, that we're able to kind of condition them to, to do a little bit better. We're also working on projects that relate to selective breeding. Can we, if you have a coral that you know doesn't bleach one year, and we're able to combine their uh, genetic material with other corals that didn't bleach, maybe they will be able to pass on that trait as well. So we're working on, you know, can we, if we're re replanting a lot of these coral reefs out there, are we able to be more strategic with which which corals may survive um, into the future? And then what I'm partly uh, helping to work on as as a project in the lab is. This whole idea of symbiosis being a really, really helpful, helpful tool. So these corals have these algae, but what's really exciting, just as there's different species of corals, there's pretty much like different species of algae. And what we're, we're finding is that some of those are able to survive higher temperatures as well. So 
are we able to kind of provide younger corals with these algae that may help them not bleach as fast or may help them recover? So these are the kind of project ideas that, that we're working on right now. Thanks, Ed. That's very exciting. Um, Josh, I want to turn to you as the policymaker in the group, and I guess the person who's part of the effort, I suppose, to turn some of this science ultimately into policy and action. Um, first, it'd be great to know, I know your office, uh, the office now in the city of Kana County of Honolulu, is really a new thing. And what really do you conceive of the role of that office? And really, what can, how do we translate some of this into policy? And what can the public do about that? Sure. Uh, well, there's a lot, of, a lot of questions in there. Um, that, so I often find myself in these sort of situations where I'm surrounded by a bunch of people that know way more than me. And I'm the lawyer, the one lawyer amongst a bunch of, um, you know, folks who have studied something for 40 years and, and beyond. Um, so there is a translation sort of piece that I think the, the office is going to try to help um, perform for the city and county of Honolulu. I mean, the f first thing I want to point out is, of course, everybody looked at the list at the end of the movie, right? And it's like, what cities have committed to renewable energy? And you look for Honolulu, and you're disappointed when you don't see it. Well, you don't have to be disappointed. We should get these guys to edit the, uh, the movie because one of the first things we did when we came in um, was work with the mayor to get him to commit um, to 100%, which happened in Miami two months ago. Um, so, you know, in the grand scheme of things, you know, the, the, that feels, that's sort of a small victory um, because, you know, the state obviously has been sort of pushing on the vanguard of 100% re renewable. Um, and we're obviously tucked within that. But there's a ton of things that we are going to be working on. Um, you know, we, we st I started on May 1st, and a quick show of hands to everybody who voted in the November elections. Um, of course, in this room, they all go up, which is fantastic. Um, so thank you, because I think this is one of those, um, you know, when you see a movie like this, I sort of fault Civil Beat for not putting out tissue boxes everywhere. Um, but one of the things that really just pulls me back into a space of optimism and, and pride is really that we live in a place in Hawaii, in Honolulu, where we have an office of climate change, sustainability, and resiliency. I have yet to find another municipal office that is tasked and, and, and at a cabinet level with focusing on climate change. Um, and it passed by a 20-point margin. So I think, you know, when you think about, you know, the, the gentleman from Australia who's saying, you know, I didn't push hard enough, I didn't speak out enough in the beginning, I think one of the things that we think about, we're very social creatures, um, is that we don't, you know, we don't want to stick our heads out too much, we don't want to really pipe up. But I think in Hawaii, that point is we're a lot further along than we may think we are. I mean, just the fact that we can go to the polls and get an office like this established, I think gives us the freedom to be a lot more active and a lot more vocal around these issues. And really, you know, when Mauna Loa is the place on earth where we measure parts per million in terms of the carbon intensity, um, and the, you know, we're so featured prevalently in this film, I think it's really incumbent on us to really lead on the mitigation side and really lead on the sustainability side um, because all eyes are on us in a lot of ways because we're at the center of where the data is being collected and where the impacts are being felt. Um, and I think that's why it's so important that this office got stood up. Um, so there's, there's two things that are happening um, at the same time. Um, in November, you know, we, we established the office. I, I started in uh, May 1st. Um, so I'm still sort of finding out where the bathrooms are and where the lights are and all that. Um, but we're going to get a really fast start. And part of the reason is um, Eric Wilson is here from the um, uh, 100 Resilient Cities group, uh, the Rockefeller Foundation, which simultaneously, while the office was being created by the voters, um, selected Honolulu as one out of 100 cities around the globe to invest in, which is, yeah. <laughs> So what this does is it really gives us an accelerated um, launch uh, for the office. You know, normally you're sort of stealing paper from other departments and you know getting started at you know piecemeal. Um, but with the support of 100 Resilient Cities, we're going to be able to sort of look in this first 12-month period at what the vulnerabilities are um, here on the island um, in our county and how we can address those. Where's the low-hanging fruit? And so we should get a really quick start on addressing some of these. And the other thing um, that I'll mention real quickly is despite what's happening on the national level, and I know it just pains all of us to see 
um, what's going on there. I think in some ways it has really catalyzed, um, certainly here in Hawaii, you know, the mayor and all, all four mayors actually and governor, um, you know, on June 5th signed that we are going to uphold the Paris Agreement. Um, and I don't think that would have happened. <laughs> You know, that, that would not have happened but for what's, what's happening on the national level. And so, I mean, I, when I sit in these seats and I look at these things, I feel like, all right, there's two paths here, right? There's the Titanic and there's Hokulea. And we are firmly on Hokulea's decks. And I feel like, you know, this is just up to us right now. And it is, you know, if nobody is going to come save us from the Federals and wherever else, um, we really need to live our values, right? And so... You know, the last thing I would mention is there's that, that one point where the clownfish is in the anemone, right? And you're thinking about, so there's this relationship between that fish and that anemone that is protective. And there's, you know, an old Hawaiian proverb that says, you know, you feed the land and the land will feed you. And see, we're in the exact same relationship as that clownfish is to the anemone. We just haven't been feeding the anemone, right? And so um, I think in our daily lives and practices, and we can talk a little bit more in the Q&A about what you guys can do, um, but the number one thing, reach out and talk to your politicals. I mean, you can't fathom how much of a difference it makes. So few people do that when a handful of people reach out, they go in, they sit down and they say, this is damned important to me, I wanna see it reflected in the budget, they actually listen. Um, and you know, you gotta use that um, sort of, uh, when they're, they're, you know, what's the, what, are, what's the, what are people doing? What should I be caring about? When you go in and you actually talk to them, you count for 10,000 people because they feel like if somebody comes in to talk to me, there's a bunch more out there that feel that way but aren't gonna take the time to do it. Besides sort of the political will, I guess, um, in the whole political climate out there, what really are the roadblocks in trying to take action uh, to save the coral reefs and preserve the reefs? What, what are really the most significant roadblocks out there? I guess political will clearly is one of the big ones. It's always economics. So when you pay very little for you know, I, I'm talking at the larger level. The, you know, these guys can answer on the coral side. Um, but, you know, when you pay too little for gas, you're not going to drive an electric car. You're not going to take a bike. You're not going to use our new bike lanes, which everybody should be using, and instead of people writing into the editor saying that they're terrible. Um, so, I mean, I, I think the first one is we've got to get our economics straight, and that takes a huge amount of political will to charge the right amount and not export um, the costs. Um, I think that's the biggest hump we can get over. I will say, though, um, the Department of Planning and Permitting just finalized um, new water quality um, standards. So for when there's, we have channelization still, but when you're doing construction projects, there's different standards now to try to retain um, uh, soil and, and those kind of things, which should make a difference. I'd say that one of the other major pieces of this is Communication. So my, one of my jobs is education at UH Manila, and I take that very, very seriously. One student at a time, 25 students in a class, sometimes more. But um, I think Bob and Shale can also speak more to that on a, a global and, and local level about other means of communication more than just formal education. Um, sure, about, I mean, it's, it's what everyone is saying, right? Like, those, you don't have to decide to be a marine biologist to make a difference um, on the coral reefs. And I think that that's something that's particularly um, powerful here in Hawaii, like unlike other places where we are, like making that connection early on and strongly to the environment. Um, and just like, I still will go out and meet people who live here who have lived here for a long time that don't know what a coral is. And it's, it's really hard to, you know, take those next steps to talk to your politicians, to um, educate, you know, your friends and family when, when we're still working on, you know, just these really basic steps. Um, but I think also, especially right now, politically speaking, I mean, I shouldn't even venture into that area, um, but there's a lot of, like, coral reefs affect everybody all around the world, as they were talking about in the movie, and I think that something that's really important is that there are a lot of other really pressing social issues that, that are tied to that, like, you know, coastal land management, economics, um, global, the global food crises. And so kind of trying to 
you know, talk about these issues as more of a package deal, I think is also really important because there, it is a further stretch than, than what a lot of people will, will talk about. I don't know, Bob. Well, why don't we turn, we have some questions from the audience. So um, I'm gonna throw these out uh, to the whole group and whoever wants to tackle them, go ahead. Um, the first question from the audience is, is the effort to eliminate uh, certain sunscreens worthwhile versus putting our efforts into something else, sort of the cost benefit? Did you want to take that one? Um, many of you may have been aware of this uh, issue with oxybenzone, which is a chemical found in the majority of sunscreens that are available. And there's no question the data are there. Um, Dr. Craig Downs has been um, kind of the guru of the sunscreen issue. A long-term colleague, he's been out here doing work on Maui and on Oahu, and there's no question that the data have shown in his studies, um, studies of colleagues and work we're doing in our lab as well, um, that the chemical does in fact interfere with the ability of corals to live and grow, uh, to be able to reproduce, and for the coral le uh, seed or larvae uh, to be able to develop properly and become part of the next generation. Anything that you do that interferes with the ability of corals or any other organism to replicate itself um, is a sure indicator that things are gonna go downhill from there. Um, it was interesting that the bill almost went forward, it made it to the legislature, it made it to the reading, and there was a full-on press from the personal care products industry with lobbyists to come out here and do everything they could to interfere with it, and they temporarily killed it, but it's not dead forever. Um, that's good news in a way because it's been a shot across the bow, and interestingly enough, um, many of the companies that make oxybenzone containing sunscreens are now making oxybenzone free. So in answer to the question and back to what are the solutions, every one of us makes decisions every morning. Um, as soon as we wake up, the decision-making process starts. And each one of us, uh, some of you may be familiar with what's called the carbon footprint. You can actually go online and figure out your carbon footprint. Uh, but there's something way beyond that called a personal footprint. When we get up in the morning from going and taking a shower, washing our hair, uh, the kinds of cosmetics that people use, Fortunately, I don't have to. Um, the kinds of hair products, again, I don't have to. Um, but the bottom line, exactly. I'm like Mr. Sustainability here. Um, we know that everybody's medicine cabinet, everybody's cosmetic bag, everybody's shower is a cornucopia of chemicals that in a state of Hawaii end up in the ocean tomorrow, period. Um, people think the toilets are magical. You flush them and things magically disappear. They don't. Um, I've dove every sewer outfall in the Pacific Islands in Micronesia. I'm working on the uh, coffee table book, The Sewer Outfalls of Micronesia. <laughs> Bound to be a bestseller. Um, but nothing is magically disappearing. It ends up in our coastal zone and ends up in the fish that swim, the corals that are trying to grow, and the things that we eat that comes out of the ocean. And without having to pass laws, everyone could decide tomorrow not to purchase any sunscreen that has oxybenzone in it. Um, for those of you that have kids, especially girls, um, it's an endocrine disrupting compound, so you don't want to use it, not just because it's bad for corals, but it's been shown to be likely bad for people as well. But everything that we do through education and through knowledge, as Cindy said, and Shell as well, um, if we can begin to look at what's available, there's a great website called the Environmental Working Group, ewg.org, and it kind of gives you the rogues gallery and some very good quality data on the things that you could find in your bathroom, under your kitchen sink today, that making some good choices from the cars we drive, I'm doing a Prius these days, and I can push that baby up to 60 miles a gallon if I use a light foot. Um, every decision we make today can have an impact tomorrow with or without laws. And then of course the political will, um, that's the blessing or the curse of democracy. You get to choose who's in charge. And when we make bad decisions, bad things happen. When we make informed decisions, better things can happen. If I can tag on to that real quick. I mean, I think, um, first of all, electric vehicles, $10,000 rebate till the end of September on Nissan Leafs, by the way, if you're thinking about it. Um, but, the, you know, I think there's, um, we forget sometimes, we get sort of oppositional around like, God, why is the cosmetics industry doing that? And they're all out to get us. I mean, there's, um, when the article came out about the, um, the, the lotion and the issues and the bill was going through, even though it didn't pass, that just the buzz around it, I had several folks call when I was at the community foundation, um, and one of them was the head, uh, one of the Cliff Bar major representatives for the um, triathlon over on the Big Island. And he said, what, what is this? I saw this, this thing, and they ended up giving out 
oxybenzone free for all the you know triathletes and which created a buzz. Um, Paul Kosasa, who is the head of ABC stores, which you know sells a lot of sunscreen to a lot of tourists, um, was on the board of the foundation and same thing. You know, when I was talking to him, he's like, I don't even know this. Like, what can we do to get it off our shelves just unilaterally? So, I mean, I think there's a lot of people out there that don't think about this stuff on a daily basis but want to do the right thing. And if they get that information in front of them, um, they can do it pretty quickly. These are really important issues. What's in our in our medicine cabinet and what goes down into the um, out the wastewater um, outfalls. But another one, and I have to channel Dr. Paul Joquiel, a, a mentor of all three of ours um, and all of ours, uh, who told us for years that really the answer to so many of our problems is that there are too many people on this planet right now and we all need to eat lower on the food chain eat lower on the food chain eat lower on the food chain I work on it I'm not perfect far from it but if we all work toward that goal it will make a difference as well can I just jump in real sure. quick at the end of that? Um, so, and also something that I find that is really helpful is sometimes like th just the question about like, you know, does changing sunscreens make a difference? I think that it's really important to figure out exactly what your differences can be to like, you know, it's hard to like necessarily change your entire lifestyle overnight, but you know, do your research, figure out what the, what the different things that you can do are that would, that would be helpful and figure out the ones that, that you can do right away and the ones that you can work towards. And with that, also finding communities. Like if you're interested in doing like beach cleanups, you'll then very quickly meet other people who are also working on the same types of things and it helps. Like having your community to take these steps towards to making a lot of these changes can be really, a really powerful way to start. Um, another question, does Hawaii need artificial coral reefs? And if not, why? If so, seed them with corals or not? Um, my view of artificial reefs is like selling people dehydrated water. Um, <laughs> we have coral reefs in Hawaii. Why would we need something artificial to replace that what we already have? Um, the reality is that there's two things that matter, and here's the geek part of it. Um, is it a matter of not having enough new stuff coming in, coral larvae, fish larvae? Alan Friedlander's excellent work on this. So are you limited in terms of what's available out there? Or are you limited by the actual bottom, the substrate, the material that's there as well? Um, artificial reefs have a pretty bad history from the days of tires. So number one, there's a big difference between ocean dumping and artificial reefs. And for many years, it was an excuse to just dump stuff in the ocean and get rid of it. Um, but the reality is, in a place that has natural coral reefs, the main focus needs to be on protecting those resources and returning those conditions that allow natural recovery to occur. There are some very cool tools. Shale and Dr. Ruth Gates' work is exceptional. Things that we never would have considered even a decade ago, we really have to take very seriously today. But everything we do to return water quality that enables these very subtle differences on the reef to improve enables them to come back again. Um, there have been some really interesting projects here, like the um, Dead People's Cemetery that they were proposing for Mauna Lua Bay. Fortunately, cultural practitioners came back. But the idea of dumping a bunch of concrete balls onto the bottom, um, sandy areas are not dead areas either. And there's a lot of things that live in the sediment. If you come out at night, you'll see hundreds of animals per square meter that live in that sediment that don't want concrete dumped on their heads. Um, so the bottom line is I'm not a big fan of artificial reefs. Um, I think the data are overwhelming that structures can in fact grow corals. That's not a question. Um, the issue is can we do a better job of protecting what nature provided us in the first place? And instead of spending time trying to build artificial reefs, take better care of the reefs that are out there and get them back from the declining mode into the growing mode. And that can be done here. Um, after bleaching events and, and uh, corals have died, have any come back to life? Yeah, I think I'll repeat what um, I mentioned a minute ago. It's, it's really exciting to see the, that some species are more resilient and some individuals within a particular species are more resilient. In fact, um, entire coral colonies don't always die. In fact, they don't even usually completely die. There's some residual tissue. Corals are strange beasts, and they're very simple and plastic and, 
and they've been around a long, long time, as Dr. Gates indicated um, in the film. They have tricks up their sleeves that we don't even know about yet. But she mentioned briefly that the tissue can be uh, up to half a centimeter, even deeper, into that skeleton. So although they may even look dead on the outside, there can be some living residual tissue underneath that can recover. So you know, there's, there's, there's certainly hope. Um, are countries around the world sharing their findings of success and failures? Is there a lot of international cooperation on these issues? Um, well, we had a really good demonstration of that last year. So last June, uh, we had, as I mentioned, 2,500 people from 97 nations all sharing their information. And the good news, it wasn't just a bunch of scientists. So we really wanted to make it not geeks and nerds to talking to nerds and geeks. It was a lot of policymakers. There was a lot of traditional practitioners. That was one of the great things about having it in Hawaii. We had a lot of uh, cultural practitioners here too. And for those of you that know Hawaiian culture, it's a very big part of the culture here, going back to the Kumulipo and the creation chant that recognizes the coral polyp as being the ancestor. Um, so the great news is that there's a lot of exchange going on on the international level. Um, I had the great opportunity to be in Palau um, last month. And Palau is a world leader. We were able to get the president of Palau, Tommy Romengasau, who is world renowned as a leader in ocean sustainability uh, to give the keynote address. And back to what Cindy was just saying, reefs had really got devastated in the 1998 bleaching event. We were down there to study that. Um, those areas that I uh, examined back in 98 that were down to 0% coral cover were over 80% coral cover. We had table corals that were two or three meters across. Uh, areas where we went, we looked for recruits. You know, I, I look at a reef, I'm not just looking at the corals, I'm looking at the four-year-olds, the five-year-olds, the seven-year-olds. Everywhere we went, we saw coral recruitment. And what we call these are positive deviants. My understanding, I finally learned that being called a deviant is a good thing, <laughs> as long as there's a positive in front. Um, but that's a lot of what we're looking at together is where are the areas where things are actually going better than they should? Um, there are areas like Papanamokuakea, parts of it, that actually did worse than they should have done um, because there's no local stressors, but that pointed to climate. Um, but uh, Alan is another one that can speak to his work on fisheries. There are many places in the world where things are actually working, and we need to step outside of our own homes and our own experiences to have that exchange to look at areas that are doing quite well and to be able to learn from other successes which are occurring around the world. So, could, could I just ask one follow-up and then I'll... Do you feel the same way that there's the same sort of political cooperation as there is between scientists and others internationally and across borders, or do others? Well, I'll just answer the give it over to Shell. Um, I work, and my official title is pet scientist. Um, so I'm a pet scientist for a group called the Pacific Island Forum, 16 island nations. Mm -hmm. And I've never worked with a more proactive group of people. Um, one of the reasons I go to Palau, and my wife can vouch for it, if I go to Palau and I come back, she goes, how did it go? I can tell her this decision was made, this is going on, this is going to happen. If I go to Washington, D.C., which I've been doing for <laughs> 35 years, hence uh, the, the spot here, um, I'll come back and she goes, how did it go? I say, I haven't a clue. You know, I talk to people at 3.30, it depends who talked to them at 4 o'clock. Um, the issue is when I go to a place like Palau, Yap, Pohnpei, uh, Micronesia, Fiji, um, people really care about intergenerational responsibility and have true leadership. The first question I'll always be asked is, will this decision impact our children and grandchildren? In 35 years of working in Washington, D.C., not once, not once, has a congressional delegate or a member of their staff ever asked the same question. Yeah, um, just to build off of that a little bit, I think, um, so I, I was at the California Academy of Sciences before I was out in Hawaii, and we did a lot of our work in the Philippines, and what I've learned from them um, is that there's a really kind of big divide what's happening in the government level and what's happening on the ground, and I think that there's a lot of hope and there's a lot of folks who are doing really incredible work to save the reefs and learn about the reefs that are not necessarily making all the decisions, and so I think that those are really important conversations to have, and Something I wanted to add a little bit earlier, it kind of touches on uh, Bob and Cindy's points, where uh, so something that we're looking at 
in, in Hawaii because we have such a you know, strong research program out here and ecosystem is not just you know, how are the other corals surviving bleaching, are they not, but we're really looking at as there are so many different species of corals, kind of what are the, what are the things that are helping these different corals survive with bleaching? Because you know, in Kanawea Bay, maybe one species will do really well and we'll have a whole bay of like, just like Prides compressa, for example. But if we're looking at you know, what can that biodiversity be, um, I think it's you know really important to start looking at like what are those traits like is it the tissue thickness is it the skeletal structure is it those uh, partnerships with the different types of symbionts and then can we take that information and have these conversations with some of our international partners to get ideas of like what might happen in these areas what corals um, should we be you know targeting for protection and things like that so kind of bringing it full circle. Shale, I think this next question is for you too. So. This is really, it was, how do you plan to condition the coral in, are you conditioning the coral in the ocean or young coral that will be planted? That's a great question. Um, so right now we are basically trying to figure out what is our toolkit? Like what are the possibilities? It's this whole idea of, you know, when, a, when disaster strikes, do you want to be ready or not? And so at this stage, what we're really doing is we're, do, we're, trying, we're trying everything kind of that we can think of. We're trying things in the lab, we're bringing corals in, and we're you know, slowly ramping up the temperatures. Because a lot of times for, for, we're talking about coral bleaching, it's how hot and how long. And that's not something that we can usually predict. So a lot of what we're looking at is, you know, can we slowly start ramping temperatures up? Um, how will these corals do if we do that repeatedly? In the field, we'll take corals, like in Kanye Bay, so same water area. Um, we are lucky in that sense to have really different ecosystems within this single, single um, area where they can differ in temperature, in their ocean chemistry, and how long the water is in these areas, and, and move them from one part of the reef to the other and see how they do. Will they grow faster? Will they respond better to um, sort any sort of stress? And so what we're doing right now is trying to understand kind of what are the possibilities that are out there. We're not, um, right now we don't have plans to, you know, move these corals outside of any of these areas. And, that, and that's a really big concern, right? You know, like, what, like, at what point do you, do you make decisions based on, like, do you want corals, do you not want corals? Um, how far away, you know, if you, if you have a coral, um, how far away can you bring that coral without changing the ecosystem? And so that's why a lot of the work that we're, a lot of us do here is looking at how can we take kind of these ideas that we're learning here and then share those ideas with other folks in different areas so that they can kind of use those ideas, see which ones work better for them in their own areas. Um, we'll just do a couple more questions. I think we need to wrap up. How about the impacts of ocean acidification? Is that, though I guess they're not totally unrelated, um, is that his... Uh, problematic as global warming, or as uh, warming seas? I'll take it first, Scott. Um, there are two hand-in-hand -hand problems. So the same problem that's generating the mass bleaching events due to elevated temperature is also changing the acidity. The ocean is not turning acid, but rather the pH, the acidity of the water is increasing. Um, think about it, I don't know if you ever did that experiment as a kid, but if you took a tooth that fell out and you put it in a glass of Coke overnight, did anyone ever see what happens? Tooth disappears. Soda is a pH of about 2.2, which is really, really acidic. And this is basically what's happening is as CO2 builds up in the atmosphere, it's not, it's not magic, it's basic chemistry 101. CO2 gets pushed in the surface waters and it begins to carbonate them. And that's why soda is so acidic. It's the CO2 carbonated beverages are acidic because of the CO2 that goes into the water. Um, it's becoming a problem because not just for corals, but for clams and shells and snails, anything that makes a hard skeleton, most people are familiar with them. What most people aren't familiar with are the tiny microscopic plankton that live out there that have shells as well, that are the base of the food chains in the ocean. And we're already seeing the impacts of this. Further out in the Western Pacific is the place where it's uh, picking up even more. But even on the Great Barrier Reef, they've been able to document a decline in the ability of corals to grow and lay down their skeleton. What's really concerning to a lot of us is it's happening to these little microscopic creatures in the ocean because their shells are so, so tiny that any change in ocean pH affects them first. And we're seeing a decrease in the amount of plankton that's available to feed everything else. Tuna are getting smaller. The food supply for oceanic fish is beginning to come down, and that's going to have huge economic, cultural, and ecological impacts. So ocean acidification is a big issue. 
The bright side is in Palau, there's a reef area growing under conditions of very elevated temperature and reduced pH that we would expect by the year 2050. And these coral reefs are thriving. The corals are growing beautifully. We see lots of babies. And the question is, how can they do it in this water, which is reduced pH and elevated temperature? And it just goes to show a lot of these solutions are already found in nature. What we need to do is watch and listen and learn from them and see what we can figure out that they're already doing so that we may be able to exp uh, bring that out to other places. And I think what will probably be the last question. Um, it's sort of a tipping point question and where we really are. So even if we stop polluting today and the Paris Accord works, won't the long-term impact of today's pollution be catastrophic? Or are some of these reversible or containable and how, for how long? Well, um, and specifically on the coral one, I'll let you guys take that. But, um, you know, I think Ruth's point on the film was really poignant when she said, it's just happening too fast for them to catch up, right? So, you know, we're such nimble and flexible and adaptable creatures all throughout nature, including humans. Um, but if you don't have enough time, then it shuts out the options to be able to adapt. So I think the reason why Paris is important, um, the reason why our efforts at the county are important is because if we can slow it down, it just gives a whole lot more options for resiliency, for adaptation, for the, the creatures as well as ourselves to uh, adapt to this. Um, I think, I mean, and it's clearly reversible. I mean, there's a million things we can be doing to be beyond carbon neutral and actually going to carbon sequestering. Um, there was another bill that was signed uh, at the legislature focused on carbon farming and agriculture and ways to try to get carbon, you know, embedded basically back in the soil so that you can actually go um, negative. And so I think those kind of things can lead the way. But again, it's not going to happen without sort of personal action and, and sort of uh, positivity on the um, policy front. So the things I would urge you, since this is the last question, that I'd urge you to do, if you're too just you know, despondent or lazy or whatever to figure out how to change everything in your life, there's this group called Pono Home. They'll do it for you. So <laughs> they'll come in and they'll just basically do an audit on all the chemicals in your bathtub and where you're losing energy savings and all of that, and they'll just figure it out. Um, so, you know, you can go that route. The other thing is the next time you get pissed off, please take the 10 minutes to write a letter to the editor and call your state, uh, county, and fed rep and just let them know. It takes like 30 seconds to do, and every time that happens, they note it down, and if 10 people do that on that day, I mean, it, it really um, does make a difference. And the final thing um, that I'd ask is, if you're interested in finding out about the office, um, what we're going to be doing and how you can help, um, we will, we're on the cusp of starting a newsletter uh, as well as, you know, putting calls out to folks when, when policies come up. Um, so write an email to resilientawahu at honolulu.gov. Um, we'll put your name in the database and we'll make sure you know. Because we are going to be trying to take, we're going to, by charter, we're going to have a commission of five climate scientists that are going to be advising the office about what are the policies that we need to be adopt, adopting to be adapting. Um, so we'll be trying to take that policy and, or that science translated into policy, but then we're going to need uh, foot soldiers to help get it over the hump. Is anybody from a science standpoint? Well, how about just quickly, corals have been around for 250 million years, a quarter of a billion years. Again, they have tricks and abilities that we don't even know about yet. Humans have not been around nearly that long, obviously, um, but hopefully we can put our intelligence to work and build the political will. And Josh, you've given us some great ideas for doing that locally. And Bob, you've got some great ideas for doing it on a, you're, you're on the ground doing it internationally. So I think there's certainly hope. Well, great. Uh, thank you all for such a provocative <laughs> and great film. Uh, uh, thank the Honolulu Art Museum for, and the Doris Street Theater for participating. And thank you all for coming out.